Okay, thanks very much, Ravi. I'm conscious that we, the program says we should be at drinks by now, so um, I'll get through this, I think, fairly quickly. I have two cases, one that shows uh, a relatively straightforward uh, example of uh, valve-in-valve deployment, and one that's a little bit less straightforward. This is a, the first one is an 80-year-old man who uh, had a, a 23 millimeter perimount valve implanted Quite some years earlier, he has uh, mild to moderate chronic renal impairment. Um, he had started to become symptomatic from uh, prosthetic valve regurgitation, which was uh, severe by the time we met him. Uh, he was otherwise in cogn cognitively in good shape. He had some LVH, but good LV systolic function. Um, his echo and catheter both showed severe aortic regurgitation good coronary arteries, and uh, we also calculated an STS score, which was high. This is, um, this is what the images look like. I hope you can see those. Um, this is a perimount valve. It's a relatively small valve, I guess, 23 millimeter valve. Um, and when uh, considering what options we have, uh, we usually consult our friendly uh, valve in valve application from uh, that Vinny Babat has put together. And this tells us what options we have, what size to choose for the selected option. So the, the, the general options, I guess, are either a balloon expandable device, such as the, uh, such as the Edwards valve, uh, and this is how you would place it optimally, sitting uh, at the bo bottom of the uh, perimount valve, or alternatively, uh, a self-expanding valve which also should be placed pretty high. The, this has the advantage of having a supraannular valve, so the small size of the original surgical valve is perhaps less relevant uh, or of less concern in those circumstances. I'm not going to show you any data. I'll mention these very briefly. These are quickly from the partner valve in valve registry recently presented by Michael Mack. Um, interestingly, valves that degenerate by becoming regurgitant Seemed, or patients who have those seem to do better for some reason than patients who have prosthetic valve stenosis. My sense of it is that patients who have a regurgitant valve tend to present earlier. It's usually a, an early, relatively early mode of failure as opposed to perhaps uh, the stenotic valves. So maybe the patients are just younger. We need to tease those out and understand that better. What does seem to matter and what really is important not only for valve in valve interventions but for surgical valve in implantations and for TAVI is the residual gradient. And this is really relates to patient prosthesis mismatch. So if you end up with a high gradient across the valve, either surgically or with your original TAVI, or certainly with a valve in valve TAVI, you don't do as well as if you have a low gradient. So I think if we're ever going to start thinking about the hemodynamic consequences of what we're doing, it's in this context of valve and valve implantation. So for us, uh, certainly at my institution, we tend to choose the uh, superannular valves, self-expanding valves, most commonly now the, the Evolute uh, R valve for a valve and valve in a relatively small surgical prosthesis. So this was, uh, this is a relatively straightforward procedure as a, re as a rule. You can see we had some difficulty crossing, but eventually, and this was a core valve, this is a normal occurrence of the core valve, this kink is supposed to be there. If you have good landing zones, you can see very easily where um, uh, the valve should end up. It's easy to get the co-plane of view, um, and you aim to have it uh, planted fairly high, uh, as shown in this uh, final result. This is a good result. We are happy with this. So there, this, this should have a low complication risk. You're not likely to rupture the annulus. You're not likely to close the uh, coronaries, the need for a pacemaker should be by rights very low because you're not going to lean against the, uh, the, pathway, the electrical pathways there. So this, as a rule, is a relatively straightforward thing. If it's a regurgitant valve, it can be a little more challenging because you don't have bulky leaflets to hold it in place. But as a rule, it's not, not too bad. Contrast that perhaps with this one. With This is an 86-year-old man who has a history of having had a 27 millimeter freestyle valve placed only five years ago. Now, I regret to tell the surgeons that we have seen quite a number of these freestyle valves, which hemodynamically are great valves. But we have seen quite a number of them come back in the first five to six years with severe regurgitation. 
and that's a bit of a problem uh, for us to deal with. It's a bit like trying to deal with primary uh, aortic regurgitation. So he came back five years after his surgery with severe prosthetic valve aortic regurgitation, an EF of only 35%. And he had been very symptomatic. He'd had three or four admissions in the previous 12 months. He had no coronary disease and uh, had a left bundle branch block. This is what his uh, valve looked like. He had a dilated and globally hypercontractile ventricle, eccentric jet of aortic regurgitation. And by uh, aortography, you can see that he has a pretty severe aortic regurgitation. This was a 27 millimeter freestyle valve. No reasons not to proceed to TAVI uh, from a procedure from, from an access point of view. I'm going to ask a couple of the panelists perhaps what, what options have we got here? What would you think is the best option for dealing with this guy? Should he go back for surgery? He's 86. He's had one operation not so long ago. Should we do a redo operation in him? His LV is pretty poor. There are some challenges to do a TAVI procedure. So what, what are the surgical thoughts? I presume this was used as a, as a freestyle route. Request. Yeah, I'm not absolutely sure about that. This is a root here. This yeah. is a valve. So but let's let's say it was a let's say it was a root. The audience, there's two ways of putting the valve in. You can do it as a root replacement, or you can do it as a uh, as an inclusion. And obviously, the root replacement um, carries slightly different things. I mean, one of the other problems about it is is the root can calcify. So mm -hmm. the issue would be around how much calcification do you have? What's the mechanism for failure? Early failure in an elderly patient is generally not due to calcification. Mm -hmm. Um, so landing a, a tabby and where are you going to get this to lodge into is a potential problem. Um, on the other hand, for a surgical valve, if it's not for we re redo surgery, if we have to go in, you and it's not calcified, it's actually pretty straightforward to sew a valve in, into one of these. Um, so you just sew it into the existing yeah. So if the processes, of, if the mechanism of failure is just a leaflet's torn. Mm -hmm and there's no calcification, then it's pretty easy just to open up, cut out the, the porcine leaflets and, and stitch in stitch the valve. In. It's a big valve, you'll get a good size yeah. valve in. So technically, it's not a big issue. The other thing to remember is if an older patient has an operation, they tend not to get a lot of adhesions. So reoperating on a patient who had an operation done as an older patient is actually often not a, as scary as operating on some what, a younger patient. What, what about a sutureless valve? Again, uh, it's not doesn't fit the IFU, um, and pure regurgitation is a contraindication to at least one of them. Um, and again, you'd have to look at sizing. I, I'd, I'd be cautious about using a, uh, a sutureless valve in a non-calcified route like this, where it'd be very easy to, to replace. Darren. Um, aortic regurgitation like this, I think it's still useful to look carefully at the CT um, for, to identify that calcification mechanism. And you really don't want to leave this patient with any residual aortic paravalvate aortic regurgitation. Um, and then the question becomes, obviously, a valve out for sizing, but in, in aortic regurgitation, you're going to tend to probably err on a self-expanding valve with a um, with a rack or seal around it, so an Evolu Pro. Uh, and uh, you're going to tend to be generous in your sizing. And um, I think the patient can get a good result from um, TAVI, but you really don't want to leave any aortic regurgitation or paravalvic leak in this patient. And, and coronary heart and, and other things that you and, and, and the exact dimensions would be very important in the term. I think either a call an Evo and R, Evo Pro, or Evo Pro, probably 34, or say it's 329, and they'll expand those that might work as well. Any other thoughts? Any particular challenges? Well, there's no, it didn't look like there was much calcium, so it'd be interesting to see the CT. If there's no calcium and aortic regurgitation, that's a challenge. It'll move a lot. And it's a big valve and all of those things. So these are the dimensions. Of, it's a 27 millimeter freestyle. When you go to the app, it says that it's a 26 millimeter internal diameter. So it's a question whether do we trust that? Do we still want to see the CT? Um, I think for these we do. Uh, the recommendation was for a 29 millimeter core valve. The app still hasn't been updated, I don't think, for 
Evolute R and Evolute Pro. But if you're going to use a, a, a self-expanding family, uh, that this is what was recommended. Now we, um, this was before Evolute Pro, but we decided to use a bigger one of 34, the bigger size we had. And you can see that there are a number of issues. First of all, it's very hard to know where the annulus actually is, where the bottom of these lifts are because of the severity of the AR, it just gets obliterated. You can't tell whether you're in the coplane of view, you can't really see where the, the, the bottom of the, the cusps are. So it, there are all sorts of reasons why this is going to be a, a difficult uh, problem. Um, if you want to, and we didn't in this case, I think there was an issue with radial access, but you can put a, a second pigtail in the left coronary cusp from a radial uh, side just to help try to identify and give you a little bit extra contrast in the aortic root. So that's been done and recommended if you're trying to do severe AR. So this is, uh, this is what we chose, a 34 millimeter Evolute R, which crosses, uh, as you'd expect, pretty easily. Uh, this was our first pass. It was high. We decided that it was too high. We still had a fair bit of uh, AR there. It looked like we were probably, again, it's really hard to tell, but we thought we were probably higher than optimal there, so the valve was recaptured. The next pass was clearly too low, as was the third pass, as was the fourth pass. <laughs> Uh, and the poor old Medtronic rep was starting to get sweating as we, we were well ex exceeding the number of recaptures. Um, but anyway, in the end, we finally got uh, the device sitting in what was a pretty good spot. I think we were happy that this was high, but uh, would stay there once we let it go. So in the end, we accepted that and got a high implant, but a good result. Um, and I think the lack of a radiographic marker here is really probably the hardest part yes, of the case, right? Yes, absolutely. We could, I suppose, have done it under, tra under transesophageal echo. We did not. Uh, we don't use transesophageal echo as a rule, but that might have actually been valuable in just confirming that we're at the right level. This is what it, it looked like a, a month later. Um, the valve has uh, minimal aortic regurgitation and uh, no gradient. His LV, unfortunately, hasn't recovered. Thank you very much.